Today we're gonna to go over care of a very familiar medicinal plant to many of us, aloe. Yes, we will focus on probably one of the most well-known of the aloes, aloe vera, but I also want to take the time to introduce you to some other species, hybrids, and cultivars, for which there are many, in the hopes that will actually stoke your interest and understanding more for the genus. Now, aloe's center of diversity is in Africa, particularly in the southern and central parts of Africa, Madagascar, and then there's also this arc in Western countries like Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Togo, Benin, and Nigeria, for example. But it can be found throughout the continent and also off of some islands as well. Now, aloe vera, which is the one that we're most familiar with, this is native to the Arabian Peninsula. So it's further away from some of those main aloe hotspots. And when we think of aloes, we probably most often think of desert dwelling species, but with such a cosmopolitan range across much of the African continent, you really do get a mix of habitat types. Now, some aloes are in high altitude terrains and can tolerate frost and even some snow, and others are in grasslands and can withstand and in some cases rely on natural fires in order to flower and fruit. Others are in more subtropical climates, and then a wide swath of species are in those drier terrains, but sometimes are found sheltering under larger plants, so they don't wanna be necessarily in that full sun, they'd prefer a little bit more dappled shade, but can withstand some full sun once in a while. So it really does run the gamut. And depending on your aloe's parentage, you might be able to get away with some different care strategies. But what are some of those characteristics that unify aloes all together? Well, they are actually perennial, which means they do come back and flower every year, unlike the genus of agave, for which it looks very similar to, which flowers once and then it actually is kaput. And then aloes are also very long-lived and are particularly shallow-rooted, which really comes into play when we talk about potting medium, repotting, and watering. And I have this plant that I'm going to pot up here later, and you could just see that it has these roots, and sometimes it has these shallow roots that kind of go down, and it doesn't really have that, lo like a long tap root that goes down. Also, the leaves are pretty much all fleshy, as you could see here. This is probably one of my grassier aloes, but it's a thicker grass-leaved aloe, and it does still have a little cushion in it. And you could see like even this aloe ferox right here, uh, kind of ferocious spines on here, but also very succulent leaves. And of course, you know, your aloe vera, which also has those succulent leaves that you could break and use medicinally. Now, I don't have too many examples of the, the grassier species besides here, but you can see how fleshy in general all of these leaves are. And they're also tapered and have this um, U-shape or boat shape look in the cross section. So if I actually cut any of these leaves in the cross section, then you'll see this kind of U or boat shaped. And then also they have these uh, prickles along the edges of the leaf itself. And in some cases actually have prickles on the leaf itself. So that is another characteristic of a lot of aloes. Some of them will actually cause a little damage to your skin, whereas others like aloe vera are actually not that bad. Oh, and I actually, I really wanted to show you this one aloe in particular, just to kind of comment on the difference between the prickles and also the camouflage. So let me go run and get it. So I was talking about the prickles along the margin and oftentimes aloes will have that in order for to, you know, to protect the leaf. But then on the other side, you have this kind of camouflage or mosaic pattern. So I wanted to get the aloe variegata here because I think this is a great example where it does it has some prickles, but they don't hurt at all. Um, it's not like this aloe ferox, for example. And, um, and but it has a little bit more of that camouflage. So what I think this actually shows is that maybe from an herbivore's perspective or from an insect perspective, it might look like 
like little leaf mining or maybe some eggs that have been laid on the leaves itself. So maybe that actually provides some camouflage. Maybe if you're an herbivore and you look at this much in the same way that you see zebra stripes, it kind of get, looks a little bit confusing. So I think that's um, kind of an interesting thing. So you could get a sense you know, of the range of, oh, is my aloe a little bit more camouflaged or does it have some of these sharp prickles? Now, another interesting thing is when aloes mature, they form these rosettes, as you can see here. So you're very probably familiar with your aloe vera forming this style type of rosette. And in some cases, some of them actually spiral. But what could throw some folks off, especially if you're growing aloe from seed, is that young plants often look like their relatives, the gasteria, or ox tongue. So this is the gasteria, which has this more fan shape, or, or maybe it looks like a little bit more like an open book. So you could see that I have a couple different species here that are young and have that characteristic fan shape. So this is an older allopherox, and this is a younger allopherox, and you could see that this has that fan shape, very similar to Gasteria. Allostriata right here, which also has that fan shape, and yes, and then this grassland aloe that also has this fan shape because again, these are more seed grown, they're young, and then eventually they'll start filling out and forming that rosette, which is pretty cool how they change form like that. But you'll also see aloes adopt to many growth forms over its lifetime. Some are stemless. Those are the ones that I kind of like because they stay a little bit more squat, but others are tree-like some ramble and creep across the ground. And, uh, and yeah, and then there's also little dwarf species, which is really great for houseplant enthusiasts if you don't have a lot of space. But then on the other side, you have others that could grow tens of meters tall and look like trees. Now, a lot of aloes look stemless when they are small, but over time, many of them will actually start developing stems and some get woody and others will naturally protect their stems and the rest of the plant by maintaining dead leaves on that stem. So if you've ever had an aloe and you start seeing the, the lower leaves die and they, it's not easy for them to come off, so here we go in this aloe striata, you could see this kind of stemmy trunk kind of coming up here. And then uh, some people don't like that look, but in nature, that is actually normal for aloes and they will start to develop almost like this trunk and this dead layer of leaves that look like a skirt. Uh, and I think it looks pretty funny, but a lot of people don't maybe find that aesthetically pleasing, but it does serve important functions for the plant. Now you could get aloes to bloom indoors fairly easily. I mean, I don't have one blooming now. This one looks like it will set out a bloom later, but they are spectacular blooms and they come in colors like reds and oranges and cerises and yellows. And most of them you'll find are really brightly colored and will grow on these long stalks, which tells me that they're probably trying to attract some type of pollinator. I would say some type of butterfly or skippers, something during the daytime, because usually it's those white flowers that will attract moths and they come out at, the ni at nighttime. Now, some of these are seed grown so I would say like a, some of these are about two, less than two years of age, and I'll probably have to wait a couple years for them to actually bloom. But if you put your aloes in a protected but bright spot outdoors in the summer, then you're likely going to get it to bloom more reliably. Which does bring me to light. Indoors, you'll want to give your plants fuller sun, but it can be protected bright light. And I would say that some of these darker hued leaves, you could get away with giving it a little less light. But you know, I have my aloe vera in my northeastern window and it's totally fine. It does have this kind of weird growth structure, but it's been growing like that for a while and you'll see it has this woody stem and you'll see a little offset coming off of here. But if you look at the wider collection of my aloes here, you probably could guess which ones could withstand a little bit higher light and brighter conditions. And I've actually you know, put some of those over here to my right because they have this kind of glaucous hue, um, kind of this bluish bloom on them. And a lot of those would appreciate being in higher light conditions. Now, if you're starting aloe from seed, 
just be sure to protect them from high intensity sun because they are most vulnerable at that stage as most seedlings are. Now, if we talk about temperature, I'm going to have to generalize here, but most aloes can withstand high temperatures and a very light frost. But for the frost part, nothing that is too enduring, otherwise your plants will fail. But it really does depend on your species of aloe because those that are from higher altitudes can withstand colder temperatures. Now, I know a lot of aloes that are native to Lesotho tend to be more frost tolerant and other aloes like Allotherascii is less cold tolerant, so you'll need to actually protect that from any type of frost damage. Now I found keeping my aloe vera next to a drafty window in winter has had no real impact. So again, this is something that you're going to just want to experiment with. Now let's talk about potting medium and watering because no aloe likes to have wet feet. So if you tend to be heavy handed on the watering can, then you'll want a grittier potting mix. Sometimes you'll want to match the potting medium that your plant came in and your grower's medium if you're not getting the plant bare root like this one is in bare root. But otherwise, if you know yourself, then you want to get something that has a grittier mix. So maybe you're going to be using a little bit more perlite, Maybe you'll use a little bit more horticultural sand. Uh, here's a mix that I like to use. You could see that it is more grit than actually potting medium. So I do have a little bit of potting medium in here, but I have some perlite, I have some clay, I have some volcanic stones. I even have some bonsai mixture, but this is how I get proper drainage in with my plants. And I'm actually going to pot this one up right now. And what I wanna show you about this one though, this is actually how you could propagate your plant too. Let me move this. And you can see that a little offset has come off here and that is how you clip off offsets if you don't wanna leave them on the mother plant. You wanna get some of the stem. So even this one right here, I could just kind of pull this one off. It has its own roots. There you go, you can see those little baby offsets which are just very cute. And again, we talked a little bit about the shallow nature of the roots of the aloe. And again, they don't have this really extensive fibrous uh, root system. Maybe when they get larger, they will. But here's what I'll do. I'll just actually tease apart these roots. And this is a pretty good bare root specimen. This is not a species. This is actually a cultivar. I think this one is known as black gem. And so what I'm gonna do seems to be a reasonable size potted. It could go a little bit larger in the, the planter pot, but I'm gonna put about an inch to two inches of soil down below, or potting medium. And then I'm just gonna lay out the roots, just like that. Some of these dead leaves I could actually take off. I could clip them off too if they didn't come off so easily, but they did. That doesn't always happen. And I'm just gonna use my spoon and work some of this potting medium around. So that white stuff that you see in here is the perlite. And that will also provide some very good drainage. And I'll link to some of the mixtures that I'm using here. I make usually my own mix, but I combine a number of different pre-made potting mediums together. I also think this looks really nice and when you have this in the full sun, some of that grittier mixture doesn't compact as easily. You know, if you're using a heavier peat or cocoa coir mix, sometimes it actually crusts up and it's harder to water the plants. So there you go, you see that. And actually, I might, I might actually plant these little baby plants. I might keep this one in here and then I might plant the other one up somewhere else. So this hasn't really established too many roots. So when I water this, I'm not going to worry about watering it too much because this is a really well-draining mixture. So if I'm watering it really thoroughly, also it's a terracotta pot, it is painted on the outside, so it'll retain some of that moisture. But terracotta pots in general will basically wick away some of that moisture. If you don't wanna wick away a lot of that moisture right away, then 
What you'll wanna do is actually soak your terracotta pot for maybe even like an hour or two hours just so all of those pores in your terracotta soak up all that water so it doesn't suck the water too much. But in the case of aloe, I think it's absolutely fine. And then I'm gonna take this little guy, hmm, and I might plant it up right here with these little ones. And they're little for now, but I'll tell you what, these aloes could get quite large and formidable. And I'll just need to create a little card for this one so I don't forget what it is. Because again, when they are small, they have a little bit more of a gasteria shape, as I mentioned, that little fan shape. So you could see as they're small, this looks more like a fan and this is more of a rosette. So let's actually talk about fertilizing because if you're going to be generous with the fertilizer, then fertilize with a succulent fertilizer. So this I would say more on a monthly basis, but honestly skipping a year with your aloe is not a biggie. These are often growing in severely poor soils and substrates. So growing in your potting medium indoors is going to be a luxury for these plants to start with. So if you're giving them a little bit more like a cactus or succulent fertilizer, so say like a 011 or a 111 or a 212, like something very lightweight for your plants is going to be perfect for them. Now let's talk about troubleshooting and common problems with your aloes because besides suffering from rot, if you're watering them too much and the soil isn't draining, aloes are pretty resilient. Now they may get some scale or mealy bug. I actually even saw some scale on my aloe vera, but aloe vera in particular could get chill damage because this is a plant that does not like to be in too cold of temperatures. Although I did tell you, I have this up against my drafty window in the winter and it seems to be fine. Chill damage will look similar if you overwater your plant. So it'll basically get really yellow and mushy. So if you see any signs of damage like that, get a clean knife or clean pair of scissors and just snip those parts off. Now many aloes will also redden quite readily from intense sunlight. And this is a form of protection, believe it or not. So don't be alarmed if you see your plants reddening up. You could actually reduce this if, uh, if you just reduce the sun intensity. But if you have your aloes growing outdoors, if you're in one of those hotter, drier climates, then your aloes are probably going to naturally redden up. And I should say that aloes hybridize quite readily, both in the wild and in cultivation, which is why you see so many fabulous looking types on the market. I mean, take a look at some of these cultivars. This is one of my favorites. This is aloe sidewinder, and you'll see that it has all these little offsets and pups growing off of it, which I'm so excited about because if we ever do get a plant swap um, underway again, then this is one that I would love to trade up. I mean, look at those little pink hash marks on there. I think this is just a really beautiful piece. And I think a lot of horticulturists really enjoy mixing and matching aloes and getting some of these really great cultivated species. Now, when it comes to species, unfortunately, some are being rapidly harvested to the point that wild populations have been depleted. And that's the case for aloe peglarae, which I actually have here. But this is a seed grown plant. So you just have to be aware of these issues so you know where you're getting and what you're getting on the market. Now, as far as medicinal varieties go, aloe vera is hands down the most important of the medicinal cultivated species. But second most is actually aloe ferox, which is this one or this little guy that I have here. Now it is also being commercially traded, not as much as aloe vera, but it is wild harvested, unlike aloe vera, which is cultivated. So you again, have to be careful where you're getting your plants from. Make sure that they're seed grown and not being wild harvested because this does actually put a lot of pressure on the plants. And I don't know, I think that's just about it that I'll share with you today to ensure that this doesn't become an hour long video on aloe care, but I hope you enjoyed this little show and tell and demonstration. Bye guys.
If you didn't hear yet, we just released Houseplant Basics, which is an introductory mini course for beginner houseplant enthusiasts. The video-based course is set up to be both concise and comprehensive, and it serves as a perfect primer for our Houseplant Masterclass, which is a month-long course on houseplant care, cultivation, and more. You can find out more information on both courses at homesteadbrooklyn.com or search for the courses in the description below.